everybody is aware. There that is. And um, if you have questions, uh, you can, we're asking you to put them in the chat. Those of you joining on Facebook, um, you can also put them into the chat on the live stream and we will be piping them into the Zoom chat. And to be aware that we do live in Maine and internet connectivity can sometimes be unstable. Uh, I think several of us are uh, near uh, some thunderstorms and other exciting weather events right now. So if someone pops off, we are going to come back. We, you will be allowed to come back in. We will try and find our way back here. Um, but you know, that's the way things are. Um, so we'll just, we'll, we'll do what we can and it's gonna be great. So now, um, what we've really been waiting for, I have the honor and privilege to introduce folks. So, uh, Fu Tran has been a high school Latin teacher for more than 20 years, while also simultaneously establishing himself as a highly sought after tattooer in the Northeast. Fu graduated Bard College in 1995 with a BA in classics and received the Kalanen Classics Prize. He taught Latin, Greek and Sanskrit in New York at the Collegiate School and was an instructor at Brooklyn College's Summer Latin Institute. Most recently, he taught Latin, Greek, and German at the Wayne Fleet School in Portland, Maine. His 2012 TEDx talk, Grammar, Identity, and the Dark Side of the Subjunctive was featured on NPR's TED Radio Hour. He his acclaimed version, uh, memoir, Saigon, um, a misfits memoir of great books, punk rock and the fight to fit in received the 2020 New England Book Award for nonfiction and the 2021 Maine Literary Award for memoir. Saigon was named a best book of 2020 by Amazon, Audible, Kirkus Reviews and many other publications. It's an honor to have you here with us tonight. I turn it over to you, Fook, um, and hopefully the audience, you're all engaged and ready to listen and enjoy. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Allison and Nicole. Um, Allison, you did an admirable job reading my business card. That's a lot of <laughs> very small typeface and information all crammed onto my calling card. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm so humbled and grateful to um, be selected along with Meredith Hall for this year's or the summer's Read Me program. Um, so uh, it's surreal to say the least. I, you know, it was probably, it's probably very high on the list of things I was not expecting was to have the entire state of Maine reading my memoir. But, you know, here we are, here you are, here I am. So. Um, uh, I'll just, I thought I would just read out some short, like some really short selections from the book. I know that you all hopefully have read it. Uh, I don't want to be like the teacher who's going to play gotcha and give you a pop quiz to see who read and took notes and who didn't, but I'll, I'll read a little bit from the book. Um, and then I'd love to just be in conversation with the attendees and answer questions. And um, yeah, I'm curious about um, things that you're curious about. Um, so I'd read, I thought I would read a little bit from uh, the prologue of the book um, and then another selection later in the book. Um, nestled in the Susquehanna Valley town of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Carlisle Senior High School sprawled as a monolithic mid-century modern block of types, archetypes and stereotypes. Industrial gray lockers ringed its hallways, the compartments narrow enough to repel most of your textbooks, but wide enough to collect the trash and detritus from your backpack. It was like your own personal landfill. Linoleum floors, classrooms with chables, the combo chair tables of the 70s, blackboards, American flags, loudspeakers from which the wah, wah, wah of adults speak would drone. Our school district was so large that the juniors and seniors had their own separate high school, the so-called senior high school, and the freshmen and sophomores had their own underclassmen high school building. Carlisle High School stocked its seats and bleachers with a familiar cast from the 80s, the athletes who towered above the rest of us, the cheerleaders who lay supine beneath them, the geeks with their physics books under their arms, the preps with their tree-torns, swatches, and impeccable Benetton sweaters, a handful of black kids with MC hammer pants and tall square afros tightly faded, 
punks and skaters with their leather jackets and black converse. A few swirly hippies, the rednecks with their oily palms and cigarettes and trucks. Carlisle High School was another cultural cul-de-sac built with the craftsman blueprint of John Hughes, the Frank Lloyd Wright of teen malaise. Overwhelmingly white, Carlisle's population offered all the rainbows of Caucasia. The town's main employers were Dickinson College, the Army War College, a smoky stack of factories, and the service industries that had sprung up to support the aforementioned trifecta. In the spirit of public education, we progeny were all in the mix together. The itinerant army brats, the ivory sons and daughters of professors, doctors, and lawyers, the greasy offspring of waiters, cooks, and factory workers, and the token refugee family. The Tran family blended right into the mix like proverbial flies in the ointment. That is to say, we didn't. Carlisle's glitter was unmistakably 80s, but its structure was straight from the post-war era, bricked together by the mortar of the 50s. We had a downtown Woolworths with a chrome luncheonette counter and red vinyl stools, and a grand movie theater with its incandescent marquee. The four corner of Carlisle's town square were righted by two courthouses and two churches, Episcopalian and Presbyterian. God and law and law and God. It wasn't a subtle message to any of us living in Carlisle, what was at the heart of the town. And the piece de resistance, our high school was the town's designated Cold War fallout shelter. The blue and yellow radiation placards festooned our hallways, reminding us that we were only a button push away from nuclear annihilation. From what I gleaned on television, Carlisle seemed like a slice of American pie a la mode. We bottled lightning bugs on summer nights, trucks flew Confederate flags, we loitered at 7-Elevens and truck stops, we shopped at flea markets and shot pellet guns. My high school provided a daycare for girls who had gotten pregnant but were still attending classes. We stirred up marching band pride and fomented football rivalries. The auto shop kids rattled by in muscle cars and smoked in ash and cobbles before the first period bell. We were rural royalty, Dairy Queens and Burger Kings. So I'll pause there and I'm just gonna jump just to a quick, just, um, just to the quick opening of chapter eight, which is, which, which starts out with a little uh, recap of the Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis is a simple story. Gregor Samsa awakes to find himself transformed into a giant bug. When he discovers that he's a giant bug, he immediately looks at the clock and thinks about which train he can still catch to get to work on time. So by himself, he's not freaking out about being a giant roach at all. His parents and sister, whom he's been supporting, freak out. His supervisor from work shows up and freaks out. Gregor has turned into a bug, but he does not freak out about his transformation until he has to navigate his relationships with his family and his work supervisor. You read the metamorphosis and you realize it's his family's ugliness towards Gregor that moves the story. Gregor is now a giant roach and he cannot do anything about it. His family, instead of acting with compassion and kindness, sends Gregor to his room and locks the door. What's worse than turning into a giant bug? Turning into a giant bug and having your family act like a bunch of assholes. And isn't that adolescence? A biological change over which we have no control. And then our family, like a bunch of assholes, treats us like an insect in the midst of a metamorphosis that we ourselves hardly understand. Suddenly, with a different focus from the perspective of a bug, we can see who they really are. Alrighty, so I'll stop there. Um, and uh, I'm happy to entertain questions <laughs> or just yammer on about whatever you would like, Allison or sure. Nicole. Yeah. So what? Uh, just to remind everybody, if you have questions, you can pop them into the chat. I know um, from my reading um, of the book, um, I was just totally, totally entranced by the structure of how you did the chapters and then tied it to the literary 
um, events. Um, maybe um, you could talk a little bit about that and that you selected the prologue because I found the prologue incredibly um, helpful into just preparing myself to enter into the story. Sure. And then I find found myself alone with each chapter and then the literary significance was just made me curious. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what is this guy doing? No, thanks. I appreciate that. You know, it, it um, the idea came really, it was, it was sort of baked into the very first thing I ever wrote. Um, so, uh, so I was approached by a, a literary agent in New York who had seen the TEDx talk and she, you know, this was 2016 and she sent me this email sort of out of the blue and said, you know, Hey, I just saw your TEDx talk from four years ago. Um, I think you've got an interesting story and an interesting way to tell it. Would you ever consider writing memoir? And I was like, oh, maybe, I guess I don't, you know, I was very busy at the time. Like my kids, you know, I have young kids at home and I'm working two jobs. Um, and so after a few months of sort of gently pestering me, um, I just sort of sat down one evening and maybe like over a weekend and wrote uh, the prologue essentially as it is. You know, I just kind of thought, well, I'm just going to write this thing and, if she likes it, great. And if she thinks it's terrible, that's that's okay too. Because <laughs> I really don't have time to write a book right now. Um, but in baked into that prologue was sort of talking about my relationship with this kid, you know, all told through, through the lens of the uh, Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray. Um, and so when she read that, you know, her early reaction was, you know, she loved it. And she said, could you do this for the rest of the book? Like, could you tell your story through the lens of another book. And I thought, yeah, absolutely. You know, for whatever reason, like, I, I guess I have like some kind of brain damage or, you know, got hit on the head by like, you know, uh, one too many sort of annotated Shakespeare's or something, but it's just the way I triangulate my experience and my life. And, you know, I, I very much sort of like think about everything that happens through, you know, the lens of books and films or music. Um, I think it's it's a way for me to connect with people. It's a way for people to connect with me, and and so it was it was not hard to do, um, and it was incredibly natural. Um, I, I was actually, frankly, really delighted um, when my agent made that suggestion because I I thought I didn't want to just like tell my story as like a you know here's another kind of like plucky immigrant refugee story. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously it's you know everyone's story is different, um, but I think she was excited that. That I was willing to take on the challenge of trying to tell the story through the lens books as well. So thanks, thanks for being excited about that, Allison. Yeah, yeah, it was um, just the connections um, that kind of illuminated the story too. So we have someone. Um, so we've had uh, Connie and Ben said to everyone, "Yes, I love that." Pamela Bobka Curtis Memorial Library said, "Yes." Um, Sheppy Van everyone your book is a wonderful coming of age story with a special twist related to some of the classics of western literature including the iliad <laughs> yeah <laughs> getting a lot of good comments oh thanks um, yeah um thanks. shelly batuski to everyone violence in your family was a big issue with the perspective you have now how much was the violence part of vietnamese culture and mm. then how much was simply part of your family's culture? And a third question is, how is your relationship now with your parents? So I can break those out if you need them. Yeah, no, no, that's great. That's great. Um, I think it's hard for, you know, I, <laughs> I, I definitely do not want to sort of speak for all Vietnamese people. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, I will say that uh, it seems like in comparing notes with other Vietnamese kids of, or, you know, adults of my generation, like, it seems like, it, you know, violence was probably more common than not. Um, I think the challenge for us is thinking about, you know, we're in a specific place where, you know, we are the kids of parents who went through sort of one of the, you know, I, I can't imagine an upheaval, you know, sort of more traumatizing and difficult than, you know, having the country that you live in completely collapse and then fleeing it with the shirt on your back and as many family members as you can gather. Um, so I think, you know, I think like the, the violence that was in our family and the violence has, that to me, at least from my perspective, seems common in 
this generation of like Vietnamese American culture, I, I couldn't imagine how that's not a byproduct of the upheaval that happened in 1975 when South Vietnam, you know, fell. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I, I so I don't, I, that's as best as I can answer it, you know, without sort of like putting my foot <laughs> in my mouth anymore. Um, you know, my relationship with my parents is, is good, goodish. Um, you know, I, um, did, did a lot of therapy in my thirties and, um, you know, I think I sort of got to a place where uh, I accept them for who they are and sort of what they can offer me. And that's sort of the best and recognize that, you know, we're, they're sort of doing the best that they can do, you know, and I think, you know, once I realized, you know, there's a sort of a threshold or a limit to which, you know, they can, um, sort of be there for me in the ways that I need and, and they're not going to be there in, other ways that I would like them to be, you know, as long as I recognize that, like, I think I'm not, I'm less disappointed about that, you know, because like, I just, I recognize, like, I can't, I can't ask them to be people they're not. Um, I can, I can certainly understand them, be empathetic and sympathize and, and recognize, you know, sort of like all their strengths and shortcomings and things like that. It's taken me a very long time to get there. I mean, I think I was very angry as a young person. And then also even through my twenties, um, but, but it's good now. I mean, they have a, a great relationship with my daughters, you know? So I think, I think that, and that's really been powerful is seeing, especially my father, um, seeing him interact with my daughters and, and in, in his own way, like he's, he's sort of writing things for himself um, in the way that he's loving towards them in a way that he was never <laughs> loving towards me or my brother. And that's okay. You know, I, I think that's, that's powerful for me to watch um, and to recognize that even, you know, as a 70 year old man, like my father can change as a person and grow, right? Like, I think um, I would, I would certainly hope that that's true for all of us, that, that even when we're in our seventies and, and beyond that we're still growing and changing as people. Um, so, yeah. But there, there was definitely a, a, a rawness, um, but a true honesty and um, just, um, yeah, just a, a real, um, opportunity to kind of look back and, and the power of reflection and and then try to interpret that, you know, like now you're a parent yourself and, and so forth. So, and how you bring that full circle. Um, so Holly Williams um, says, I can't even begin to tell you how much I loved your book. We were born oh. at the same time. So everything resonated with me and I could relate to the cultural references. I loved your realistic language and how everything flowed so well. Oh, thanks. This would be, this would be such a kick-ass film. <laughs> <laughs> you got to know Holly. I wish she wasn't muted. Oh, Any ideas nice. of who you would want to play your part? Oh, that's really interesting. So, Holly, um, I mean, I don't want to get your hopes up, but my book was optioned for a film. Um, it's being worked on right now by uh, two screenwriters and a director. And we actually had to go back to, uh, I went back to Carlisle actually just uh, six weeks ago to give the screenwriter or the director and the, one of the producers like a little tour of my, of Carlisle as it was, um, you know, and thanks to sort of like the, you know, historical, the historic Pre preservation society, like it looks very, very similar to how it was when I was a kid. Um, you know, some things are very different, but, you know, big parts of it are very much the same. So anyway, uh, who, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, um, so casting was a conversation that we had, you know, and I think like the idea is that, you know, we just want to find some, I think the story is going to take place as a, you know, during when I'm a teenager, like there isn't going to be like an adult version of me, I don't think. Um, but I think, I, I, I think we're, I think we're going to be looking for like a young Vietnamese or Asian actor to play me, but who knows who that'll be. I think they're going to just have to just you know, sort of like beat the bushes and, and find some some undiscovered, talented young man to do it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll keep you posted, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly setting the stage for <laughs> anticipation. So yeah. all, I don't know about you out there um, on the screen. It's like, I feel like I'm a part of that now. Can't yeah, wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this might, I mean, for, you know, for what it's worth, I think this is the first time that I've sort of publicly talked about it. So yeah. Also, you know, keep in mind, um, you know, books being optioned for a film really, 
I think like 90%, 95% of the time it's sort of, you know, nothing comes of it. So, um, so that is, that is statistically the likely trajectory that, that it will not happen, but um, the producer and the director are very passionate about it. So that, that means a lot. Um, yeah, we'll see. Well, you get all this goodwill here. Yeah, today. thanks. I appreciate we'll it. it <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we got another one. Robin Feldman said, um, you took the classics to a different level and broke so many stereotypes about adolescents being intellectual. Did you have this, <laughs> did you have this grasp of the classics when you were in school or did it come later? Uh, gosh, I mean, uh, hey, wow, I appreciate that. Um, I, you know, I think I was, I was very lonely as a kid and um, I just so deeply wanted to connect with anybody or anything. And so I just, I remember reading, you know, I remember reading, you know, in high school, reading The Scarlet Letter and and just feeling this deep connection with Hester Prynne and thinking like, man, Hester Prynne really gets me. Boy, Nathaniel Hawthorne, you really, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I think, I, you know, I was also very immature as a reader. So like, I think I would read like the first like five to 10 pages of a book. And if, if it grabbed me, great. Like I would keep reading. And if it didn't, I just would put it down and just move on to the next thing. So I was, you know, as any 15 or 16 year old boy would be like, I was very, ADD about my reading. Um, but I think, I think my deep need to connect, you know, because I, I, you know, didn't feel like I had a safe place at my home. And frankly, school was my safe place. Um, you know, I think like that really, um, that really fueled my love and, and need to read. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, 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 I appreciate that you feel like I had a grasp of the classics. I think I was just reading it just to try and connect with people and, and what, you know, people like, you know, Homer and Dostoevsky and, you know, uh, Emily Dickinson were writing about. Like, I, I felt like if those books had survived this long, there, there must be some, something in there for, for me to, you know, as a human being. Um, that would say something about my condition and also about other people's conditions and all the things that we have in common. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like that's the power of the library and the power of reading. It's that like it, like it doesn't even matter what your background is. Like it, it's this commonality that allows us to connect with each other. Um, so yeah, but thanks. <laughs> yeah, so some of the comments is, yes, it was a very visual book. So a film, film makes total sense. It's like a John Hughes film. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks. And everybody's just clapping because you, you, you've done everything that you said. Um, so Jen, to everyone, I was one of the army brats born in Carlisle while you were in high school. Oh, wow. I yeah, I loved reading about your discovery of the list of books that became your reading list in high school. I had a very similar experience when I discovered an AP literature reading list my freshman year. In your years of teaching high school, do you find that this is common or do you think it's more common for certain types of students? Um, gosh, I, um, can I get a clarification? Do you, or Allison, do you think which, which part of it is common that like kids just find a list of books and all of a sudden just. So she loved reading about your discovery of the list of books. Yeah. That soon, that then became your reading list in high school. She evidently had a very similar experience when yeah. she discovered an AP literature reading list. Gotcha. I, I don't know if it's common for kids to find a whole list and then start reading that list. <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's amazing to me. Um, I, I don't know. I think, uh, I think in my years of teaching, I, I, it's rare for me to meet young people who don't have a favorite book, no matter what it is. Um, and I think, and as soon as I hear them say like, oh, this, I loved this book. Like, I think I'm immediately curious and I want to engage them in a conversation about it. You know, like I, and I don't make, I think it's like a false and frankly, kind of a toxic distinction between like sort of like the classics and like sort of like high brow literature and like low brow literature. I think if kids love to read and they're connecting with each other, you know, in their peer group and they want to like be excited about it and tell their teacher about it, like I'm, I'm all ears, you know, um, because like at the end of the day, like, you know, kids are reading and they're connecting with an experience and, and, and that's powerful. Like, I, I, you know, I get, and it doesn't have to be Jane Austen, right? Like it could be Harry Potter. I mean, uh, you know, that, that millennial generation, like, I mean, like lots of people, right. Credit JK Rowling and the Harry Potter series with 
birthing an entire generation of like really sort of um yeah sort of avid avid readers and kids who just love to read you know like wait <laughs> do you remember like the last harry potter came out and kids were like little kids with their parents were like at midnight like at the bookstore with, like their wizard hats on that, that was like that brought me like really like to tears i just love seeing that yeah. so yeah. yeah it's great so, so yeah. kind of a follow-up to that um Shepi Van says, tell us what led you to teaching and why classical languages and not <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> put me to the test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I mean I um when I was when I went off to Bard to college, I um I was going to double major in art and English. Um and then by the end of my fall semester, like I was really unhappy with the classes that I was in um, for, for a number of reasons that I won't get into. But so I just kind of jumped ship from English and art and ended up by accident taking ancient Greek. Um, and it was the hardest, it was like the hardest thing I'd ever taken up to that point, you know, it was, and, uh, and I immediately fell in love with it because it was just so rigorous and demanding and unforgiving. Um, and so I just kept taking, I took Greek and then after Greek, I took Sanskrit. And then after that, I took Latin. And then after that, I took German. And um, and then by the end of that, I knew that I wanted to teach. Like, I think I, I always knew that I wanted to teach, you know, in part because, um, you, I mean, really in large part because of how important and powerful my high school teachers were um, and college teachers. But really, um, my high school teachers were just, I mean, without them, I, I would, I I can say with certainty, I would not be the person I am, or even maybe even be here without them. And, um, and I just thought that I couldn't think of a more fulfilling and an important thing for me to do with my life. So I went off to grad school to be specifically, I, I did like a classics, like a two thirds classics degree, one third teaching degree, because I knew I wanted to teach high school. Um, so yeah, so that's how I ended up teaching. And sort of, I ended up in the classics sort of by accident, but then discovered, you know, it's sort of like accidentally climbing Mount Everest, you know, you're just like, oh, this trail looks hard. And then you just sort of start hiking and then all of a sudden you're at the top. You're like, oh no, what have I done? But yeah. yeah. So following that full arc, um, Connie Hughes is asking, so why did you leave teaching? Yeah, so in 2019, I mean, I taught right up until 2019, um, you know, it was the, it was right before my book was going to come out and I had gotten, you know, this is also before the pandemic and I'd gotten a, a book tour schedule um, and it was, you know, like 12 cities in six weeks and I just wasn't sure how I was going to juggle tattooing and running the shop and also being a teacher, you know, and also going on this like six week book tour in the middle of like the school year, it just it felt like a lot to navigate. And so originally, my plan was just to take like a year or so off while the book was out so they could do sort of like the press and all that, all the promotional stuff, you know, properly. Um, because like, I, I, you know, I care too much about teaching to sort of half ass it and do it badly, you know, or, or you know, tell my students like, hey, I'm, I'll be back in two months or six weeks, you know, like, good luck with your finals or, you know, whatever, that just seemed terrible. Um, and then, so I was not teaching and then the pandemic happened and I just thought, oh, this is not, you know, this seems like a good time to just sit back and, and frankly, right now I've got so many writing projects and other things like that going on that, that I, I just don't know if I would have the bandwidth to do it if I were also teaching and tattooing. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how to not do two jobs at the same time, I guess. <laughs> I tried to do three. I did do three. I was, when I was writing, I was also teaching and tattooing at the same time. And that, that was a lot to yeah, navigate. Yeah. I used to teach high school back in the day. And I know it's like a, it's a, it's an encore performance every day. And every day. Yeah. yeah. Every day. Yeah. And you're totally on and it, it, you know, you want to do a good job. So it, it takes every fiber of you being to just. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. So there's another um, question here, and it's from Carrie Gosselin in Lewiston, and she says, "Oh, he, he, she, not sure. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, what brought you to Maine?" Yeah, my uh, my wife is from Maine. Um, she is from uh, Oakland, Maine, in Central Maine. So shout out to <laughs> uh, Oakland and all the Central Maine people. Uh, yeah, so we were living in New York City at the time, and in uh, 2003. Um, we were just sort of doing the math on, 
you know, sort of the next steps in our lives, you know, having kids, buying a home, starting a business. And and it just seemed like all those things were cost prohibitive in New York City. So um, she showed me this brochure. She was like, hey, Maine, the way life should be. And I was like, great, (laughs) let's move there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Great. So Elizabeth Bullard to everyone, she's asking, what's on your reading list now? Your recent favorites? Yeah, I, I mean, I can't sing the praises of uh, Meredith Hall's book, Beneficence Enough. You know, I I didn't read it until I was um, nominated along with uh, um, with Meredith by Christina Baker Klein. And I, so I immediately got it and read it and it was just like blew me away. Um, so that's incredible. Um, I'm, I think that book is just, I, yeah, it's just incredible. I will be tuning into that, that zoom in August as well, just to hear Meredith talk more about that book, her book. Um, uh, I just finished, uh, so I'm reading, I'm reading some books. Uh, I'm working on a novel right now and I'm reading some books that are adjacent or tangential to some of the themes in the book. So I'm rereading, um, Kevin Wilson's book, uh, Nothing to See Here. Um, it's probably one of my favorite books in the last 10 years. It's it's just so well-written. Like, it's so, like, I have to put it down. I read, like, five pages. I put it down. It's so good. It's, like, it's almost too good. It's, like, foie gras. You're just, like, small bites. <laughs> you can savor it. Yeah. So ne- Kevin Wilson's Nothing to See Here is incredible. Um, and I just finished... Um, uh, another book, it's a memoir by Nicole Chung, uh, C-H-U-N-G. It's called um, All You Can Ever Know, I believe. Um, and it's about, she's a Korean uh, adoptee and she's wa- raised by white parents in sort of like this very small, white, all white town. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I don't want to say more about it, but it, that was a very, very good book as well. Um, so those are two two sort of standouts yeah three I guess yeah your response reminds me why I love my job <laughs> because yeah. you get yeah. to be with people like like yourself and then also introduced to Meredith Paul and then it's like this voracious appetite to read everything that you can and so just taking I love personal recommendations and uh just exploring those so we got some more questions sure, sure. um so should we expect another book from you soon? This is Pat <laughs> Uh Yes, but it's not going to be what you think. So uh-huh. yeah, so um, this is official news. So I can talk about this book uh, or books. I, so I sort of accidentally wrote uh, a children's book series um, and that's coming out in um, 2024. The first one is coming out in 2024 and then I think 25 and then 26. Um, yeah, and I can I can tell you the sort of funny story behind that if you want. And then and then I'm working on a novel. Um, I'm I'm excited about sort of the challenges of that. I you know my my agent feels like I've got like at least one more nonfiction book in me. I, I don't disagree. Um, I'm not sure what it is yet, but uh, we'll see. But um, yeah, so the the children's book series is uh, is about a. Can I swear? <laughs> Wait, can I swear, Allison? I don't. <laughs> I'll, I'll say. We're all, I'll say, we're all adults on here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, I guess I already used the word asshole, so I, you know, in the in the reading, but uh, it's about it's about an asshole construction crane in Cranky, um, and uh, yeah. So I was, yeah. So anyway, I wrote this children's book series, and uh, Harper Collins has picked it up, and uh, so I wrote just one. They loved it. And, and then they said, we, we love this. We need you to write two sequels to it. So, um, so yeah, so I have to write two sequels to this children's oh. book. Yeah, there's no profanity in the children's book. It's very, it's like for three to eight year olds, but it's, it's like about this like very cranky construction crane. Um, <laughs> yeah. That sounds fun. Thanks. We'll be looking forward to it. Thanks, thanks. Um, here's another one. Um, it's from a reader in Old Orchard Beach. Um, how did you get into tattoos, receiving and applying, and why do you call yourself a tattooer rather than a tattoo artist? Oh, okay. Thanks. Oh, that's good. That's good. Wow, yeah. deep, deep questions. Um, so I, you know, uh, I think tattoos were a, a huge part of like the punk rock scene when I was growing up, um, but they cost money and I just didn't have any money. So I never got tattoos when I was in high school. 
Um, and then when I got to college, that was when I started getting tattoos. And it was really, I still didn't have any money, but I discovered that this emergency credit card that my parents gave me had a cash advance function, which I didn't know about. And then I was like, what's this? And it was like free money. I'm going to take it. So, so I started taking money out. I'm like, this credit, this emergency credit card. Yeah, it's an emergency, right? Um, so that's how I started getting tattooed. And then, um, and so I, I got tattooed through from undergraduate through graduate school. Uh, and then at some point in graduate school, um, the guy who was tattooing me uh, this was like 1996 said, you know, Hey, we're, we're looking for an apprentice. Like you, you should apply to be an apprentice, to be a tattooer. It seems like you're really into the lifestyle. Uh, and I thought, Oh, like people do this for a job. Like, you know, and it was in my last year of grad school anyway. So I just thought, okay, like I'll just apply, and, you know, see what happens. And so I applied for the apprenticeship, which was in New York city and, and I got it. And so after grad school, I moved to New York city and, um, you know, I taught Latin during the day and then I tattooed at night and I did that for 20, 20 something years. Yeah. And then, yeah. And then I, I call myself a tattooer uh, because I, I think it's more of a craft than it is an art form in the sense that um, I'm not doing what I want on clients. Like it's like the subject matter and the style and everything is very much dictated by the client, you know, and I think, and it is a highly technical um, craft. So um, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm like a, almost like a furniture maker, you know, that like, and that's not to say that like, you know, be chairs, beautiful chairs and tables and armoires and things like that can't be pieces of art as well, but they, but they serve a function first. And that function is dictated by the client. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think the term artist also with tattoo artist feels redundant to me in the same way that we don't say illustrator artist or painter artist, right? We or sculptor artist. We just say like they're a sculptor or a painter or an illustrator or a tattooer. So I feel like there's like a little bit of a redundancy there with the with adding artist to it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's incredibly clarifying. Thanks. That's Thanks. good. Yeah. Um, so Elizabeth Bullis said our book group at Parsons Memorial Library and Alfred loved your book. Capital oh, thanks. loved your book. Oh, <laughs> we wanted thanks. a second book that continued from where you ended so in terms of maybe that second book there definitely needs to be a sequel yeah the college years and then like uh, yeah you know it's I, I certainly will consider it. it you know it doesn't for me like at least right now when I think about it it doesn't have like that in uh built-in narrative tension that like a coming of age story has you know with ending it you know, graduation in high school, like that's sort of like baked into the narrative. Like, it's just like, just get me across the finish line, <laughs> like get me through high school and I'll, everything will be fine. Uh, whereas like the next part of my life, you know, I, I'm not sure what that finish line looks like or, or how it plays out in terms of crafting a narrative. You know, and honestly, like, I'm not sure like who wants to read the chapter about whether, you know, can Fook really refinance his mortgage to take advantage <laughs> of historically low interest rates? Who knows? Let's find out. <laughs> So. I bet you would make that incredibly interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll do I my best. I would read it. I would read it. <laughs> Thanks, Alison. Uh, so there's another question from Jen. She says, how is your Vietnamese these days? Did you ever reclaim some of the fluency you wrote about losing as a teenager? Did um, your relationship with Vietnamese change in light of learning lots of other languages? Yeah, I mean, it comes and goes, you know, I, I don't, I'm not near my family. I mean, I think anytime I, my parents call or my mother calls, like I'm speaking to her in Vietnamese or some sort of pigeon of Vietnamese and English. And frankly, she forgets words or she doesn't, like, I would say, you know, she just uses whatever word is sort of like closest in her mind. So I would say like half, like 25% of the words that she uses are in English. Um, and then and then the rest is in Vietnamese. And I think that's true for most Vietnamese American families. Like they're just sort of switching back and forth between the two languages. Um, but I think because I never went to, like I was never formally educated in Vietnamese and, you know, I'm, I'm functionally illiterate. Like I can't read it. Um, you know, it's probably, I'm probably at like a second or third grade level. You know, like if you drop me in Vietnam, like I wouldn't die. I could get food and find a hotel room and all that stuff like that. But I couldn't discuss the you know, a recession in Vietnamese or anything like that. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I'm curious about Vietnamese. I'm not sure like it, like there's like a functionality to it that, that I'm not sure 
like the investment in my of my time and efforts to like learning learning it better or just for me it's really just about like vocab acquisition like I, I'm not sure when I would use it and who I would talk to <laughs> so um so yeah you know honestly I, I would rather make my French better like I have as part of like the diaspora I have relatives like my aunts and uncles and a bunch of cousins who are in France you know and I would love to like my French is pretty like it's crappy like and I would love for my French to not be crappy just so I could talk to my French relatives better um but yeah yeah interest always learning <laughs> yeah always yeah, yeah, yeah always learning yeah. <laughs> um so Shelly's asking your book exposes lots of issues with your parents uncles aunts and grandparents and this might be a tough question but it's mm. how did your family react to the publication of this book yeah, this is great. I love this. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's a great question. Um, so the person that I was I was most nervous about reading my book was my brother. Um, you know, I'm, I'm closest with my brother, and you know his his experience and my experience overlap the most in terms of like a Venn diagram. So I I, I thought if there was anybody who was going to call sort of BS on the story and like how I told it, it would be my brother, you know, um, but he read it and he texted me and he said, you know, he was like, dude, you really nailed it. Like you really captured both, like the two things that you really captured were the dysfunction of our family and our experience growing up in a small white town, you know, as the only refugee family. So I just thought, whew, like also my brother's a lawyer. So I was really worried that like, you know, he would sue me. <laughs> so he did not do that. And he, you know, I got the thumbs, the thumbs up from my brother, Lou. So I felt like anybody else who thought that the, that the book misrepresented something, you know, that was obviously their, you know, their right to feel that way. But, but I, I feel I felt really um, validated with my brother's sort of reaction to the book, you know? Um, so my dad, I, you know, my dad didn't read it for a long time. And then, you know, we were on a text thread and I, I finally, you know, after like nine months, I think, and I said, Hey, like, did you read the book? Like, just curious. And then my dad just texted back, like, yes, I read it. It was very painful. Um, and then that was it. Um, so that was all, that was it. Like that was the only time that we had talked about it. And that was nine months after the book came out. And, and then just as a quick aside, like I just saw my parents um, maybe like two months ago for the first time in three years. And the first time since the book came out and, um, and then somebody asked my dad, like, you know, what'd you think of Fuchs book? And, and all my dad said was, you know, I didn't like it, but it's his story to tell. And I mean, I, I can't ask, you know, I mean, like, again, like going back to this idea, like, this is not the man that I grew up with. And it's, it was pretty powerful to see that, that he was able to just say, say that, you know, that, um, that he, he didn't like it, but you know, that that's okay. Like he doesn't have to like the book. Um, and I, and I don't blame him. It's, you know, I mean, I say some pretty, you know, I reveal some things that I'm sure that he's embarrassed by and, you know, wishes that he could have done differently and all those things, but yeah. yeah. So Robin's asking, and there's a couple more questions because I know sure. we're, we're getting closer. Um, yeah. Your graduation speech had to do with souvenirs. And for me, it linked back to your father destroying your souvenirs, records, posters, t-shirts. Was mm -hmm. that speech for your father more than the students? Gosh, yeah, that's uh, that's such an interesting take, Robin. Um, I don't think so. I think you know when I was writing the speech, like I think, uh, I think I was just writing it as a way of saying, like I, you know, I didn't want to take any of any of it with me. Like I, I felt, I felt, I think as as a lot of us do at graduation time, like I think it's 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 like a really difficult mix of emotions right like you feel sad you feel excited you're like I can't wait to get out of my town and you're like but I'm also gonna miss my town and I think I think the speech for me was just a way of saying like I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave everything behind and whatever I take with me is gonna be inside me but that I don't want to take anything or need anything physical um because I just it's too complicated and and it's just too much, like it was just too much for me to process, I think. Um, yeah. But it's an interesting, I, I, I'd never thought about, about it being directed towards my dad, but that's interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Hmm. Yeah. These questions are so good too. Yeah, uh, they're great. To they're everybody great. out there. Um, so <laughs> Pat's asking, have you ever considered it how different your experience might have been as an immigrant had you been living somewhere other than Carlisle, Pennsylvania? Yes, yes. Like I in think... a large city, Philadelphia, New York. Yeah. Um, might have been more community support? I think so. I mean, I can't imagine that it, it w- I can't imagine that it wouldn't be different. Um, I think it's for me. It's not. If you <laughs> if you watch my TED talk, you'll know that I it's it's hard for me to sort of fall down that rabbit hole of like shoulda woulda coulda. Like it's not generally be- for me beneficial to think about that. Um, it's not fruitful, I guess, uh, or it doesn't feel like uh, work that's going to help me. You know, that said, like a, my cousin who grew up, who came to Carlisle, but then her parents left maybe after like a year or two did end up living in California um, among a, a, a very diverse, in a very diverse area, like just outside of Los Angeles with like lots of other Vietnamese people. Um, so I think it, as, as well as you can, like that seems like a pretty interesting comparison side by side of like sort of my, me and my brother's or my my brother's experience and then her my cousin and her sister's experience and you know I'll say th- things like this like you know she as soon as she got to college like she sought out like the Asian students organization and joined them and like found sort of her community there um, whereas like I never felt the need to do that um, I think I just found I just found other ways to find and create community and it just wasn't centered around my ethnicity because I'd never, I'd always been the only one. <laughs> and I, I, I guess I just gotten used to it. And so I just thought like, I would rather just find people who love the same books and movies and music that I do. And like, let's just skip all this other stuff. <laughs> just as a takeoff on that last question, Please, Elizabeth yeah. says to go on from that, how was it for you making main home, the difference between the eighties and today and being an adult? Yeah. I mean, huh. couldn't be more different. Um, yeah. I I love it here. Um, and I certainly, um, I feel more at home in Maine than I've pretty much felt anywhere else in my life. Um, so that's really great. Um, and, you know, and that's not to say that it doesn't, you know, Maine doesn't have its own challenges and things like that. But, you know, they're, they're, they're not any sort of challenges that it's no, to me, it feels no different. Uh, growing up in or living in Maine than say like living in Pennsylvania just in terms of like the diversity of it but I think the diversity is only one piece of it you know like the natural beauty of Maine is just like you can't beat it and um, you know in general like I think the people are great and and Portland is great I mean my daughters love it here and and um, and I just think it's a different time too like it's not just an issue of like Maine versus like the rest of the world I think it's also like 2022 is just a very different time from you know the 1980s um like I think my daughters feel more at home and feel like a sense of place here like a strong sense of place in a, in a good way that that I never felt about Carlisle um so I think it's it's just incredible like you know like the fact that like my daughter my who she's 11 and I was talking to her about my experience growing up and I said is have you ever heard anything like anyone ever say anything like racist to you? And she's like, no, never, like ever. And I was like, wow, that is amazing, right? Like, I feel like sometimes when you feel like the world is not going in a good direction. And then, I mean, I, I, I mean, I just, I'm flabbergasted. Like, I couldn't believe it, you know, like, it, it, um, I mean, she hears like gendered insults, like that's not great, right? So we, we still have work to do people, but the fact that like she's grown up here in Portland and has never heard any kind of like racial slur directed at her. I just am like, wow, you know, like uh, I just is amazing. Like that's, I don't know, that feels like progress to me. <laughs> so we're inching up on 755. There's a couple sure. of questions here and then we'll probably, um, oh, this one's good too. Robin asked, mm. oh, they're so good. I just, <laughs> um, so Robin asked, is your anger about racism different today than it was as a teenager? And what do you do with the anger? Yeah. I, mean, I had to I, ask that one because it just fell into Yeah, just... no, that's really great. That's really great. You know, it's funny, like my, uh, I I just don't have the time for it. You know, like it, I think it like, I, I I just don't let it get to me. Like, and I, I recognize like that I've done a lot of work and I say that from a place of privilege, like, you know, my wife 
it's sort of like it's funny like we my wife gets so much more angry about like the racism that I have to endure than I do I'm just like eh it's like new to her so she's like what I can't believe what's going on I'm just like ah but then it's like also the opposite like when I hear about like sort of like the the sexist you know crap that she has to deal with like I'm enraged you know and she's just like welcome to my world buster and I'm just you know so in some ways you know like um I mean it's it's um it's powerful right it's powerful to sort of be just a for just a moment to see the world that a woman has to navigate like that it's just like that just makes my I, I can't even tell talk about how angry that makes me and I think my wife feels the same way um I just don't have the energy for it I feel like I've got too much energy you know I, I only have so much bandwidth in my life and I would rather spend it on trying to do good and like you know help people and um you know so I don't and, and honestly I, I can't I, I haven't experienced like sort of like really overt racism in a, in a while. Like it's more kind of like low key racism as opposed to, you know, like people yelling things at me from a car. I mean, it happens. And I don't know. I, I also feel like those people are just sad and you know, I feel sorry for them, frankly, more than anything else. Yeah. yeah. There were two other questions in the chat, which we won't, we're running out of time, but um, there was one um, just wondering if you had been back to Vietnam and then if you were in touch with any of your friends from high school and, and if you can answer yeah. those two. I'll, sure. still... I'll do this real, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have not been to Vietnam. It's, it's very high on my list. Um, we were going to go and then the pandemic happened. And I, at this point, I'm waiting for my daughters to be old enough so that we can just sort of all go as a family. Um, right. You know, I, I waited for a long time to go with my parents and my parents refused to go back. Like they're they're mm -hmm. still very, very angry about the war and how that all went down. So the, my parents have never gone back and they will they will never go back. Um, and then um, I was not in touch with my high school friends really until, you know, I mean, a little bit like through social media. And um, I went back to uh, a high school reunion under duress from my wife, actually. She was like, this is going to be good for you, mister. Like she, you know, she's really pushing me to grow as a human being. <laughs> and so I went back to my high school reunion and reconnected with a lot of people then. Um, and then when I was doing research for the book, I went back to Carlisle in 2017 or 18, I think, and, and reconnected with some of my, my chums um, just to, you know, make sure I had like facts and, and timelines correct. So um, and now we're, we're in touch, you know, especially, especially with the book having come out, like, I think lots of friends have reached out that, that I hadn't heard from, you know, in a while, but yeah, so I'm still yeah. in touch with them. And a lot of them still live in Carlisle, actually. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, thank you. We're running out of time. It's seven, yeah, thanks. seven so I got to bring back Nicole, uh, if she's on and there she is. I'm here. I think I pinned myself and then you aren't pinned anymore spotlighting let's see thank you for handling all the technical stuff nicole oh my pleasure um i i just have to Fook, this is i hope i don't embarrass you but i kind of do at the same time so uh -oh. we before we wrap things up um i i just have some very exciting news to share um so as Maine's affiliate center for the book for the Library of Congress, each year, we at Maine Humanities Council are asked to choose a book that in some way represents our state's literary heritage um, to feature at the National Book Festival. And this year, in addition to selecting a picture book, um, as always, we are also featuring something geared towards our older readers for the first time. And we just love your memoir so much um, that in addition to being part of the summer's Read Me program, we have also chosen it to represent Maine as a Great Reads from Great Places book for the 2022 National Book Festival of the Library of Congress. Thanks. And so I'm so glad. I'm so yeah, glad. Yeah, unreal. Thank you so much. I was really, I, when I got that email, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, Thank you so much. It's really like such a deep honor to um, yeah, be be a great book from a great I, I hope my book could live up to the greatness of Maine, that's for sure. <laughs> and I just yeah, I just want to share with everybody too. Um, because we all we want we all want to see um what happens. So we um there's a link in the chat um that I'm going to I think it, that one just, all right. So you can find the big great reads list that has Saigon 
um, listed there uh, at the read.gov site. And then for the book festival, it is live and in person uh, in DC on September 3rd. However, there's some really wonderful, and I'm very grateful for this, um, recordings and events that are being um, piped through various video feeds. So there's another link down there where you can see all of the authors, a bunch of authors, panel discussions, and perhaps some more from you, Fook. Um, so even if you can't be there in person, you can you can participate with the book fest. Amazing. But I'm just yeah. so happy. So yeah, I thank you, know, you so much. Thank you. You're a main <laughs> author. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. It's um so just for so just for your attendees, you were uh Allison and Nicole and I were laughing about how um well I was telling them about how I was I was at a bookstore recently and they had a section of like main authors and and my book was over in just like the memoir biography section. I was like, oh, I guess I'm not a main author, but Library of Congress, I mean, they don't lie. So haha, I am a main author. <laughs> you are a main author, thanks. sir. Thank yeah. you, thank you. All right. No one's you can't get rid of me now. No, we claim you as our own. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Finally. Now and forevermore. Somebody wants me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the event. This is really great. Well, a great conversation. And, uh, yeah. and thank you. No, to all the just a, on, yeah, on behalf of the Maine State Library, it just, um, like I said, it just makes me so glad I chose the career I did and I have the job I do to witness greatness and every day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so and to celebrate Maine authors. And I'm so grateful for uh, the library's relationship with the Maine Humanities Council who always makes me want to grow and learn and explore more. So, um, and I've got a shout out to the group tonight. Oh my goodness. I just, oh, the questions were phenomenal. Yeah, they were phenomenal. great. They were great. Uh, your participation was great and uh, great night. Yeah, you are you. smart. <laughs> and I hope you come back, join us, because uh, Fook will be here too uh, to yeah. ask questions uh, for Meredith Hall's talk and conversation on August 25th. Yeah. So everyone should come back and ask equally as amazing questions then. Absolutely. Well. All right. Thank you. Well, I guess that concludes. So enjoy the rest of your evening. Hopefully, the thunderstorms have passed. Everybody's safe and sound, and tomorrow is a new day. <laughs> Great. Great. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, so everybody. Bye, Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye.